In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did, not, who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word of the Lord. Interestingly enough, there is a, uh, a season in the Christian year uh, called Epiphany. And it, um, it, it's not as well known as Lent or Advent, uh, it la it's actually, it, you, it ordinarily is understood to be between Advent and Lent, because in Advent we're looking at the birth of Jesus, and in Lent we're looking at the death of Jesus. And so Epiphany is actually a period of time to look at the life of Jesus, which, by the way, for those of you with a college education, you already knew that that's what happens between the birth and the death of somebody, is the life. And, uh, and during, during the dark time of the year, Epiphany means... There's a light that has happened, that Jesus Christ has come into a dark world. And, and during those uh, months between, uh, the, these months in the dark times of the year, we look at Jesus. We just look at his life, his words, his deeds. And we're going to do this for two months. We're going to be looking at one gospel, John, and what John shows us about the life of Jesus, the words and the deeds of Jesus. So we start with this very, very famous first chapter. It's also called the Prologue of John. And uh, this, it is so rich that it takes a little pressure off me because one of the things that ministers want to do is we always say, oh, if I'm going to preach on a text, I've got to get all the good stuff out to give it to people. Well, there's too much good stuff to give you. So I can't do it all, not in the time allotted. What I can do is give you a top-level look at the outline of it and the basic uh, gist of it, which is powerful enough. So let's outline it. 14 verses, right? Verses 1 to 4 gives us a claim. Verses 5 to 11 show us the widespread rejection of that claim. And verses 12, 13, and 14 give us an answer to those objections and rejection of the claim. So there's the claim, there is the rejection of the claim, and the answers to the objections. Right? Okay. First of all, let's look at verses 1, 2, and 3, 4. Uh, and in here we have a claim. This is very famous because it's about the Word, and we learn five things about the Word. The Word is a person, He. The Word is a divine person. The Word was God. He's divine. Now, there's a danger at this point to say, okay, so the Word was with God and the Word was God. Well, that means that this is a divine-ish person, a kind of person with lots of uh, divine, at, you, know, you know, a kind of spiritual person. No, no. This is an uncreated divine person. Because it says in verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. You know what that says? Everything that has a beginning got a beginning through him. Anything with a beginning got a beginning through him, which means he doesn't have a beginning. So he's the uncreated creator. So he's a person. He's a divine person. He's an uncreated person. He is the source of all life, verse 4. In him was life. That's where life comes from. And lastly, verse 14 reveals that this is Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The world became flesh. Now, uh, it, would be, it would take all night. It would take you know, uh, five weeks. It would take a year 
to just unpack those five st- claims about Jesus. But there's a, there's, a, there's a central issue, central claim that's being made here that can only be made if we take a little bit of time to think it out because the main thing that John is saying about Jesus is not just that he's divine and he's personal and he's this and he's that, but that he is the word. And the Greek word that John uses here very deliberately is uh, when he wrote this in Greek is that Jesus is the logos. L-O-G-O-S. In the beginning was the logos and the word was, you know, the logos was with God, the logos was God and Jesus Christ is that. The logos became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, He was using, John was deliberately choosing a word that had a lot of philosophical, cultural, and linguistic freight to it. And unless you understand what that freight is, and we do a little bit of background here, we can't understand the startling nature, the radical nature of this claim. Now, to understand it, it goes like this. Uh, The Greek philosophers looked at nature, and they saw balance. They saw balance, they saw order, they saw harmony, and they believed that behind that order and harmony was a cosmic spiritual principle of that order that they called the Logos. One, um, uh, one, here's a philosophy book, just a textbook, that says this about it. He says, um, the Logos for the Greeks was the impersonal, harmonious, divine structure of the cosmos as a whole. In other words, the Greeks said, look, look at all this order. Where does this order come from? There's some kind of principle, some kind of divine structure, some absolute uh, cosmic order that the world is a kind of out uh, working from. Now, uh, okay, this has been very intellectual so far, right? Very esoteric, very elevated. Don't some of you feel really good about yourselves just for being here at a place where we talk like this, isn't that? Well, just let's bring this down to earth. And if you're gonna understand the logos, this philosophical concept, I gotta talk to you about my space heaters. Uh, my building is undergoing the, uh, the uh, under, is enduring the, uh, the tribulation called Local Law 11. Local Law 11 means, as you know, the, every five years you have to inspect the facade of the buildings to see whether the bricks need or the, you know, the mortar needs to be repointed or anything needs to be done. And so when it's decided, oh, yes, you do need that work done, then they put these guys up there on scaffolds and, and they put scaffolding up there and they're on these uh, platforms and they go up and down and they, they fix the outside of your building. Uh, in our case, when they're doing that, we're not allowed to have our heaters on for various reasons. So they give us space heaters. The, the management of the, of the building is the space heaters. Now these space heaters comes with, come with direction manuals. And you know what's in the direction manuals? The logos of the space heater. The direction manual tells you what the space heater was made to do, what it was designed to do. See, the word logos doesn't just mean word. It has a, a broader range than that. It actually means purpose or reason logic, say logos logic, the reason for existence. Well, these, these, the, uh, the directions, the space heaters, the directions say, here's what the space heaters were built to do. This is their reason for their existence. Here's what they were made for. And so it says, don't plug it into this source, plug it into this source. It says, don't put it over there, put it over here. Because it was made to do this, but not to do this. And what the directions are actually doing is they're urging me to align my use of the space heater with their design. Because if I don't use it in alignment with its design, at the very best, I just won't get the proper value out of it. At the very worst, I will burn down my apartment. So the Greek said, what if the universe has a logos? What if life has a logos? What if there is a a reason for life that we all have to align our lives with and then it goes well? And then we can be content. And if we don't align ourselves with it, if we don't align ourselves with the ultimate reality behind the universe, what's happening? We'll not be content, or at worst, we'll burn our lives down. We'll burn our lives down. And so the Greeks said, that's it. There's there's an absolute truth behind the universe that we have to get ourselves aligned with. And, and of course, now there was a difference of opinion about how to do that, or even what it was. 
Um, the Stoics, as you can guess already from the, the, their name, <laughs> the Stoics was a particular school of Greek thought, very powerful. And the Stoics believed that the way in which you aligned yourself with the, with the, the, the universe, ultimate reality, was that you accepted everything that happened. Anything that happened, no matter how bad it was, you didn't let it get to you, you just said, that's it, that's life. So you're aligning yourself by, by summonsing up all of your self-control to always accept everything that happens and never let it get to you. See, that's one way of aligning yourself with the universe. Now, most people didn't take such ambitious ways of doing it. There were people who said, well, the, the logos, the, the reason for life is actually to make the world a better place for the people who come afterwards. So you need to make the world a better place. Other people would say, no, the reason, the meaning of life is to find what makes you happy and be happy. That's the Epicurean. So they all have very different views on what it meant to align yourself with ultimate reality, what it meant to bring your life into alignment with ultimate reality, and then the earthquake. And it was an earthquake. John chapter 1 was an earthquake. In this book on philosophy, history of philosophy that I just read to you from, I'm going to read to you again. It's not written by a Christian, it's written by a French philosophy professor who's an atheist, but he just basically says what, what, what histories, uh, people who, who know the history of, of thought, human thought, um, have said, and that is, up until this time, both Greek philosophy and Eastern religions believed that, that the heart of the universe was basically impersonal. There was a kind of cosmic spirit behind things, but the universe was basically impersonal. And what it meant to align yourself with, it, with ultimate reality was to find what you know, the, the natural order of things and align your life with it. It meant being a moral person or a strong person or a brilliant person or something like that. But along comes John. And with all that background, he starts right out by saying, oh yes, there is a Logos. In the beginning, there was a Logos. And everything that happened, every, everything was designed through the Logos. And everything that existed comes through the Logos. But this Logos is not a cosmic principle. It's not an abstract set of standards. It's a person to be known and loved. Not something to be deduced through contemplation. Not something to be aligned with by summonsing up the blood and becoming this incredibly brilliant, uh, self-controlled person. But someone to, it's a, it's a person a divine person that we are to know and love, and then we're connected to the heart of ultimate reality. This is revolutionary. Nobody ever did anything like, said anything like this before. And this book that, I, that is a kind of a popular history, if you, it's actually a good book to read. It's called A Brief History of Thought. And it's uh, it basically, you can you know, buy it. It's, it's relatively brief, and it's pretty popular level accessible, though the guy is a scholar. And here's what he says. I'll start back where I'd already read. He says, the logos for the, the Greeks was the impersonal, harmonious, divine structure of the cosmos as a whole. But to the horror of the Greeks, the Christians maintained that the logos, in other words, the cosmic principle, was not the harmonious order of the world, but was a single unique personality, one outstanding individual, namely Christ. You see, up to now, everybody had always said the heart of ultimate reality is impersonal. Suddenly, along comes Christianity and says, no, the heart of ultimate reality is, a, is personal. It's the tri-personal God. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, knowing and loving each other and creating the world. And this is what he says, what, what, what the author says, was so revolutionary about that. It says, by resting its case on a definition of the human person and an unprecedented idea of love, Christianity had an incalculable effect upon the history of ideas. To give just one example, it is quite clear that without this Christian reevaluation of the human person, the philosophy of human rights to which we subscribe today would never have established itself. Now, we can't go into that. That's a tangent. But do you see what he's saying? He says, the, I, he says, the fact is today we talk about human rights and we believe that every human being has dignity and every human person is important. He says that idea came from Christianity and it came on the basis of its reinterpretation of ultimate reality. And this is an atheist French philosopher who understood that. But what John was trying to do at that point was not actually change the history of human thought. He was trying to say, get rid of this elitist idea 
that if you're going to be aligned with the heart of the universe, you need to contemplate and be a philosopher, you need to uh, be a stoic, you need to, you need to uh, have, this, have this incredible self-control. You See, that's only for, that's only for the, the elites. That's only for the most moral and the most self-disciplined and most brilliant people. But the gospel is for everybody. Because if the Logos is not a principle but a person that you can know and love, anybody can do that. And then you are aligned with the heart of reality. You are living along the grain of the universe. Wow. So that's the claim. Wasn't that a claim? Wow. But, <clears throat> very realistically, John says that that claim, though it has been influential, of course, is widely rejected. And the next section, verses 5, five to 11, talks about that and says... Uh, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though and through the world, though the world was made through him, excuse me, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, again, there's so much to say in here, but I can only give you the basic idea. What this is telling us is that there's been widespread rejection of the idea that Jesus Christ is the Logos. He's the ultimate reality behind the universe. And that to get aligned with life and to find the reason for life is to know him as a person, into a personal relationship. He's, many people have rejected that. But what's interesting about this, these few verses is it tells us there's really two ways to reject it. And they, to understand that, you have to look at this first verse in this, pass, this section, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, some of you know that that translation, that, that other translations translate it differently. If you've heard this read before, and it's read like every Christmas, for example, sometimes you've heard some translations say, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood it. Some translations say has not overcome it. Some say has not understood it. In fact, the old King James Bible used to say, or it said this, it still says this if you buy it, <laughs> excuse me. The King James Bible said, the light shineth in the darkness, but the darkness comprehendeth it not. Okay. So the darkness doesn't comprehend it, doesn't understand it, or the darkness doesn't overcome it. Well, which is it? What's interesting is, again, this is the second time I'm going to show you where he does this. John very carefully chooses a Greek word that is very ambiguous. In fact, Don Carson, a friend of mine who's written a commentary on John, says about this verse and this word, he says, this is a masterpiece of planned ambiguity. Isn't that interesting? Now, you might say, I don't get it. You know, uh, here's a word that has a, it's a katelaben. It's a word that has a semantic range that can mean to overcome or to understand. And you say, those two things don't seem to be um, related, but they are. If you think of an, a, an English word that has the same semantic range, uh, is the word master. To ma what does it mean to master somebody? Well, it could be that you just beat him in a game. You know, I mastered him on the golf course. I beat him, see. But it could also mean I figured him out. I've understood him. I've read all of his books and I have mastered him. You see, the word, it can mean what? Overcome or understand. And so when it says that there's two ways to reject Jesus Christ, in a sense, to just be hostile to him and reject him like that, or to think that you're following him but not get it. That's very interesting. Very interesting. Let me show you how that could play out or how it does play out today. On the one hand, we have plenty of people who completely, overtly are hostile. They reject the idea not only that Jesus Christ is the logos and the cosmic uh, reality behind the universe. Not only do they reject Christianity, but they reject the whole idea of an absolute truth, of a logos. They, the very idea of absolute truth or moral absolutes or a logos that we have to conform ourselves to. That whole idea is you know, is, is rejected. And in New York City, that's probably the default mode for most people. And the idea, therefore, is that uh, nobody has, to, you have to decide what is right or wrong. You don't just figure out there's some moral absolutes or, or absolute truth. Everybody has to figure it out for themselves. Um, that's the default mode. Christian Smith, a uh, 
prominent sociologist, has written a number of really excellent books in which he studies the moral and spiritual and religious views of younger, younger adults in America. He's done a book on teenagers. He's done a book on uh, men and women in their 20s who live in America. And he studied their uh, moral and spiritual religious beliefs. Uh, you might find that interesting since some of you, just from looking at you, look like you might actually belong in that category, that age category. He says, and his researchers discovered, that, there, that the moral beliefs of younger Americans in general, not all, of course, but in general, have three characteristics. Would you like to know what they are? Okay, I thought you would. Okay, three characteristics. Number one, they have strong moral feelings. They're very upset if uh, rights are violated. They're very, they feel very strongly about uh, uh, justice, about treating people and and people groups fairly, they're very concerned about the poor, so they, number one, they have strong moral feelings. Number two, they're moral relativists. They say morality is relative. Um, even though they don't use these words, the average younger American believes that morality is all person-specific and culturally relative. Do you know what those words mean? Person-specific means everybody has the right to decide what is right or wrong for you, and no one has the right to tell you what is right or wrong. It's person-specific, and it's culturally relative. Some cultures have their mores and their customs and their ethics, and you cannot tell them that your cultural values are superior to theirs and that they need to change theirs. So one person shouldn't tell another person what's right or wrong for them. One culture shouldn't say, our values are superior to your values. So point one, they have strong moral feelings. Point two, they're... They're rel they, they are moral relativists. And point three, they believe morality is self-evident. Because if you ask a younger American, well, why do you think that's wrong? Christian Smith brings this out. It's very interesting. If you ask a younger American, why do you think this is wrong? The younger American will always say, well, I, I, I just know it is. And everybody I know knows it is. So morality, they have strong moral feelings, they're relativists, and they believe morality is self-evident. Now, the... the um, the researchers concluded two things from their research. Number one, this is incoherent. <laughs> and the, inca I mean, this, the, the third one is incoherent on its own. You know, just the idea that all morality is self-evident. My goodness, people are arguing all the time. Of course it's not self-evident. But the first two points are very incoherent if you hold them together. And here's the reason why. He says, when you ask a younger American something like this, this is what the researchers would ask, give them cases. They say, okay, you know that there's a country over here where women aren't allowed to drive. Women can't have driver's licenses. The husbands don't want their wives to drive, want them to be dependent on them. And here's another country over here where husbands make women do this and that sort of thing. It's okay. What do you think about that? Well, okay. The younger American always says, that's wrong. He says, so you're saying that your cultural values are superior to theirs. Crickets. Because you see, if you have strong moral feelings, but you're a relativist, you don't believe there's a logos, you don't believe there's any absolute truth, that actually gives you the right to say somebody is wrong. If morality is relative, you might have a basis for strong moral feelings, but you have no way of saying to somebody else what you're doing is wrong. You have strong moral feelings and you can't do a thing about them. There is no basis for a program of justice. It's totally incoherent. And not only that, by the way, the researchers also said to not believe in a logos, to not believe in absolute truth is not only incoherent, but it's inconsistent because they pointed out that most younger Americans are very concerned about the poor, but they're unbelievably consumeristic in how they spend money on themselves. So if you don't, if you just completely, you know, reject the whole idea that there's absolute truth, it leads to what? Incoherence and inconsistency. Well, what's the solution? Ah, you say, well, there is a logos. There, there is an absolute truth. So you decide what that is, be the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, whatever it is, you decide what that is, and then you live up to it like the Greeks. You conform to it. You align with it. You, you live in accordance with it. Then that gets you away from the incoherence and the inconsistency of people who completely reject the idea that there is a Logos. Okay? So what you do is you just, uh, you just adopt it. But no. Now, is that really the solution? It's true that the opposite of relativism is moralism. 
in which you decide there are moral absolutes and you decide I'm going to live according to them and then I know I'm a good person and then the world will be a better place. But I'd like to show you, A, moralism is a problem. To just adopt the moral absolutes and say I'm going to live according to them is oppressive. Do you know why it's oppressive? It's oppressive in two ways. If you adopt moral absolute values and say I'm going to live according to them, it'll either oppress you It'll bring oppression by oppressing you in your heart. It'll crush you. You won't be able to live up to it. You'll always be trying to live up, and it's just a crushing weight. So moralistic moralism can either bring oppression by crushing you, or if you live up to them, can turn you into an oppressor. You know why? Because you start to look around and you say, hey, I'm living up to the moral standards. I'm not in prison, I'm not poor, I'm working hard. Why are you in prison? Why are you poor? Why, what's going on here? And so you become a bigot, you become self-righteous, you become a Pharisee. See, moral absolutes, if you just say, I'm going to align my life with them by just trying hard, like the Greeks, and living up to them, absolutes become oppressive. They either will oppress you if you don't live up to them, or... You'll, they'll oppress other people through you if you do. I said I was going to tell you two things about moralism. A, it's oppression, and B, it is not the way to embrace Jesus Christ. See, when Jesus Christ came to his own, who were his own back then? Verse 11, it says, he came to his own, and his own received him not. Who were his own? He didn't go out to the world. He, he was Jewish. He came to the Jews, and they didn't comprehend him. They didn't get him. They couldn't figure him out. Why? Well, they looked at him hanging out with, say, prostitutes and, and, uh, and, and tax collectors and sinners, and they heard him say to the Pharisees, the prostitutes and the whoremongers get into the kingdom of God before you. And they said, that doesn't understand. I don't get it. Are you trying to say you don't have to be a good person? They didn't get him. They didn't comprehend him. They didn't understand him. And that's the other way to reject him. Because you see, if you're either a relativist or a moralist, if you're a relativist, you might be overtly rejecting and hostile to the idea of Christianity. But if you're a moralist, you may, think you're, you may think by adopting and being a good person that you're following Jesus, but you're actually not. You don't understand him, and you're still rejecting him. So what's the solution? Here's moralism, here's relativism. I said relativism is incoherent and inconsistent, but moralism is a, a vehicle for oppression. Is there any hope? Is there any way through? Is there any way forward? Yes, it's the gospel. It's been there for 2,000 years. Let me, just before I show you what it says about the gospel in the last three verses, let me just put this in cultural context to see where we are as a culture. We're stuck. Why? Because on the one hand, we have rejected the idea, basically as a culture, that there's absolute truth because we see it as oppressive. I grew up in America at a time when, when I was a kid, here's what we were all told. You know who the bad people are who are trying to blow us up? Come on, back in the 1950s and 60s, who were the bad people trying to blow us up? The communists. And guess what? They didn't believe in God. See, so religious people were good people and non-religious people were bad people. But now who's trying to blow us up, everybody? Who's the, who are the people who we say are going to try to blow us up? Religious fanatics. Moralists. People who think they've got the absolute truth. And so if you, see, if you, and a lot of you were, I can tell just by looking at you, a lot of you have been raised where the bad people were the religious fanatics. And what that means is as a culture, we are rejecting the idea of absolute truth, rejecting the idea, uh, you know, we're rejecting moralism, but we said relativism is incoherent and inconsistent. So what are we going to do? Here's what we're going to do. It's the gospel. And the gospel is so beautifully put right here. Look at this. Just take three minutes with me. Uh, you know what? If you have to go to some place to explain the gospel to somebody, you couldn't do better than this. There are other places that are probably equally as good, but I don't think there's any that exceeds this. These three verses. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent or of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. For the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. Look, first of all, this tells us that becoming a child of God is a gift. 
is a gift. See, it's true that at one sense, all human beings are God's children. I mean, Paul says that in Acts 17. He's talking to the Greek philosophers, by the way. It's interesting. He's talking to the Greek philosophers, and he says, we are his offspring, he's saying, which means we're all God's offspring, but in the sense that God is our progenitor, in the sense that, for example, we could say Henry Ford is the father of the Model T. But when the Bible usually talks about what it means to be God's children, the Bible reserves this for people who've received it as a gift, and here's the reason why it's such a gift. Think of your relationship as an employer, as an employee with your boss or supervisor, if you have one. If you are an employee and you have a boss and you misbehave and you keep misbehaving, eventually you'll be fired. Why? The relationship between you and your boss is, one, is based on your performance. It's based on performance and cost benefit. And if you're not performing and you're costing them more than you're giving them, they're going to have to fire you. But if you're a good father and you've got some children and one of them starts to misbehave, and keeps misbehaving, you know what happens? If you're a good father, you start to love that child more intensely. The misbehavior kind of evokes and intensifies your concern and your, and your, and your love for that child. Why? Because a father-child relationship is not a consumer relationship. It's not based on cost-benefit. It's not based on a performance. It's based on a covenant. It's based on unconditional commitment to that child. If you try to go in to see the President of the United States without an appointment, you'll be stopped. And if you try to run toward the President of the United States without an appointment, you'll be shot. In fact, if you try to run toward the President of the United States, even with an appointment, my guess is you'll be shot. But if you're his little boy or his little girl, if you are his child, you can just run right in. Daddy. Does the Bible really have the audacity to say that it's possible to have that kind of relationship with God? If so, it's a gift. It has to be received, and you know how it can be procured? Only this way. The Word became flesh and dwelt. And here is where John, for the third time, uses a very unusual and carefully chosen Greek word, because in the Greek it says the Word became flesh and tabernacled. A completely strange use of the word. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. Now, you know, in the Old Testament, you went to the tabernacle or to the temple to see the glory of God. But you know what was going on in those temples and tabernacles. See, see all around the world, in some ways, you, everywhere, everywhere in the world there have been temples. Why? Because people instinctively know there's a gap between God and us. God is great, we're small. God is holy and perfect, we're flawed. Everybody knows there's a gap. Every country is known as a gap. So you have temples, and what do you have in temples? Temples are places where the gap is bridged by people who are in there doing offerings and sacrifices and chanting and rituals and priests. You're, you're bridging the gap. Do you know what this means? Jesus is our tabernacle. Jesus is our temple. He's the ultimate priest because he laid down the ultimate sacrifice. He gave his life. He paid for our sins. He bridged the gap permanently, which means temples aren't necessary. Dick Lucas, old Anglican preacher, I, he, he tells this story. This is just an imaginary, I can't, you probably, some of you heard me say it. I just love it so much. He says, if you want to understand the gospel, Dick Lucas says, just imagine an early Christian talking to his Roman neighbor. And the Roman neighbor says, hey, I hear you're a Christian. That's interesting. Where's your temple? And the Christian would say, we don't have temples. Jesus is our temple. What? No temples? Well, where do your priests operate? And the early Christians would say, well, we don't really have priests. Jesus is our priest. What? Says the neighbor. Well, where are the sacrifices offered to atone for sin? Well, we don't need any more sacrifices. Jesus is our sacrifice. And so the Roman neighbor would say, no temples, no priests, no sacrifices. What kind of religion is this? And Dick Lucas says the answer is the world had never seen any kind of religion like this before. It's really not a kind of religion like any other religion has ever been. Because now we are given the right to become children of God by grace. And do you know what this means, everybody? That is a non-oppressive absolute. 
Here's the answer to all the riddles. We can't live without absolutes. Huh? Incoherence, inconsistency. But absolutes are vehicles for oppression. They oppress us, or we, through them we oppress other people. But what if this is your absolute? What if this is the ultimate reality of the universe? A man dying for his sins. A man dying for his enemies, dying for our sins, sacrificing himself. He's dying on the cross, and he's praying for the forgiveness for his enemies. If you take that into the center of your life, can that make you an oppressor? Now look, if salvation is by grace through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, on the one hand what that does, it doesn't oppress you because it's grace. It can't crush you. You don't have to live up to it. You just receive it. But it can't turn you into an oppressor because you've received it by grace. So how can you feel superior to anybody else? And the man dying for his enemies, how can you make that the center of your life and then become an oppressor? Oh, you say. But haven't Christians been oppressors? Haven't Christian churches been on the side of oppression? And the answer is yes, but only because they didn't comprehend it. They didn't comprehend him. They didn't get it. They didn't hear it. They didn't understand it. They thought they were following it and they were rejecting it. This is what the world needs. This is the light that the world needs. The world needs to know how to align your life with ultimate reality through a love relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what people in the world need most of all. But even if they don't believe the gospel, they need people who live next to them. They need people all around them who believe the gospel because the gospel is a non-oppressive absolute. It helps you avoid the inconsistency and avoid the incoherence, but it turns you not into an oppressor. The early Christians, when they got it, when they comprehended it, they, they invented orphanages. They invented hospitals. They stopped infanticide of girls. They changed everything. Comprehend it. Become children of God and be part of that change. Let us pray. Our Father, how grateful we are that your Son was sent into this dark world as our light. And though this darkness has resisted it and has not understood it, it has not overcome it. Your gospel is still growing in the world, and I pray, Lord, that everybody hearing this tonight would more deeply comprehend the meaning of the gospel and more, therefore more thoroughly become ambassadors for your son. And if there's anybody here who's never understood what it means to become a child of God, I pray that they would get that right as soon as possible as they believe in his name and are born again, not of natural descent. It can't be something you're born into and not of human decision. It's not something we can earn, but born of grace and born of God. We thank you and ask that you'd pray, answer our prayers through Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening today. Gospel and Life's ministry is supported by generous partners all over the world. Your gifts allow us to share the gospel message with millions of people through our podcast, radio, and other channels, including here on YouTube. We're seeing God change lives through the increase in reach of this ministry, so thank you for your part in it. If you'd like to make a gift today, Go to gospelandlife.com slash YouTube, and we'll send you one of my books as thanks for your gift. Thank you again for your generous support, because the gospel really does change everything.